okay for Cammy? Yeah. Okay. Wow, looks like we're going far. Yeah, that's okay, right? Absolutely. That's weird. What? I don't know, it was like my phone just had like an aneurysm or something. Well, watch out! Oh my god, what was that? Did you hit someone? There's no one here. What is happening? Someone's coming. You don't believe me now, but you will. You're someplace else. You're in his place. Whose place? The tall man. He's not like you and me. He's not a man at all. But he has his ways of getting what he wants. You're stuck on his road until he gets his toll. What does he want? Death. Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live, and please help me welcome our very special guest, Max Toplin, who we know, well, has just appeared in the brand new film, The Toll, has also been in Carrie. Max, thank you so much for being here with us. How are you doing? My pleasure. Good to be here, John. I'm well. Thank you. And you know what? I'm going to jump in the middle of my questions because I just have this question that I need answering. In the movie, The Toll... It is never explained to us if Spencer knew all about the mythology, the mythos of the toll. Did he bring Cammy there on purpose? So I think, you know, that's a great question. Um, you know, I myself, I did not write it. I, uh, I produce it and I star in it. But, uh, you know, the, the, the mind behind everything is this guy, Michael Nader, who you should have on the show. He's brilliant. Yeah. He he really get into the mythology behind this old man. Um, but in, in my eyes, no. I would say that Spencer did not know um, anything about the old man. Uh, I think that he was just as surprised, but I think he was pleasantly surprised by what he came across that night and kind of took advantage of, of what he was offered by this supernatural being. I just want to say hats off, man, because you did such a brilliant performance Throughout the whole movie, I'm like, Spencer, I mean, come on, you know, make this girl realize you're not a psychopath. You're a little socially awkward, but you're not a killer. You're not a rapist. And then the big plot twist. <laughs> I did not see it coming. The big plot twist. What did you think when you read that script? So, I mean, you know, up until the, the, the plot twist, I was kind of, you know, I was excited by the idea of the character. I was excited by, you know, the concept of the rideshare driver and just how current it was. But when that turn happened in the script, I was immediately sold, where I thought, like, as an actor, it, it's just the most kind of delicious scene to break yourself into because you can take the audience completely by surprise. And there's nothing better than kind of leading an audience a certain direction and then betraying them at the end. And I just, you know, as an actor, it, it's an honor to be able to have those moments where even the crew comes up to you afterwards. And says, what the hell? I didn't read the script, but I did not see that coming. <laughs> I'm a veteran of horror movies, okay? And I did not see that coming. It was just brilliantly written, brilliantly acted, great job. So like you said, you are the producer of this movie. How did this project come your way? Yeah, so um, there, there's a, a writer, a producer that uh, my, my partner and I, my partner uh, Jordan Hayes, who's actually the, the lead, the Cammy, 
Uh, we've got a company together called 4 AM Film Studios. We've been working together for 10 years. We, you know, ev everything we do is together. But we've worked with a great producer and writer in LA named William Day Frank. Uh, he came to us and said, listen, I may have found what we, what I think is this like incredible little success. It's about ride share. And we were like, what? <laughs> you know? Excuse me. I don't think I've ever seen any like genre content about ride share. And it's so current. This was obviously before the pandemic mm -hmm. where we just were getting into strangers cars like it was nothing. Um, and immediately we said, we got to read the script. We got to know more. So he connected us with uh, Michael Nader, the writer director, had some great meetings with him. We loved the script. And then we said, you know what, let's auction this and go out and find the money and get it made. So it did go through the whole independent film, uh, circuit. It did. Like, so after it came to us, we kind of, you know, budgeted it out, Jordan and I. Um, she really is, is the line producer in, in between the two of us. And so she she budgeted it out and said, yes, I think we can do this. Um, and we went out and we found the money. Um, and we have great investors that really believe in, in you know, in the art. Even though this is genre, we, we all still believe that this is art, you know, and it does have a social message. We are talking about something that... I think is really important, which is interaction with technology and how quickly society moves and adapts to new technology. To me, I want to talk about it. Exactly. So yeah. if we can have like a really scary, fun thrill ride while talking about something important, that's the kind of film that I want to make. Absolutely. And it shows that technology and all the conveniences and greatness that it does, there are some big downfalls huge downfalls so the script was given to you i assumed you were there was no auditioning process for the role of spencer or anything like that so you know it, it was a lot of you know at the beginning we didn't say i'm gonna play spencer you're gonna play cammy it it really came down to budget <laughs> You know, it's like, where are we going to spend our money? If we're going to spend our money on actors, like, you know, we can spend it elsewhere. We can be in it. We can save that money. Obviously, we paid ourselves, you know, union lowest tier rates possible. But we knew that we weren't going to complain about the lack of trailers. We knew that we weren't going to complain about the mud and the rain. Like, in the end, it was all on us anyway. So, you know, when we first auctioned the, the property, the toll, we uh, we were just looking at it as let's cast this with the best actors possible. And slowly as we started to fund, fundraise, we realized maybe we should actually be these actors. You know, it, we, somehow Michael Nader trusted us in this and, and we went for it. And I'm really happy we did. Absolutely. Now, for our viewers who don't understand, when a movie does go into the film festivals, uh, how does the process work? Like it was in South by Southwest. It, it appeared there. How does it work from a company saying, all right, we want to pick up this movie and distribute it for you? So, you, you know, we were a very specific uh, situation when it came to our festival run because, because it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So South by Southwest, I don't know if you remember, but I think nine days before it was supposed yeah. to start, Mayor of Austin came out and said, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> and, you know, thank God it didn't. Yeah. It would have been a horror movie, um, you know, if that were to have happened. But, uh, you know, we had to pivot really quickly and figure out how do we still show the distributors? How do we get this into the distributors' hands with the, the buzz around South by Southwest without having any screenings? So... For us, it was a very different experience than your average, oh, let's go, you know, open at TIFF, let's go open at Cannes, let's go open at Sundance at South by, sell the film there. We didn't have that opportunity. So, you know, through uh, an amazing team that, that we have, uh, we were able to, you know, partner with Alamo Rap House, the movie theater chain, get simultaneous releases for kind of like a, a, a promo premiere South by Southwest screening. Uh, and then that got canceled because there were new new regulations that got passed the day of the screening. Oh, right. so we, <laughs> we migrated everything online uh, and invited, you know, kind of tastemakers, distributors, press, uh, and ended up, you know, Saban and, and quite a few other distributors saw it and thought, ooh, uh, we see opportunity here. Uh, and we ended up 
closing a really, really nice deal with Saban, who then partnered with Lionsgate. And now we've got uh, a, a pretty incredible release across not just the country, but across the world. The official release date is 2020. And from what I know, that must have been the premiere at the film festivals, correct? Yeah. The film festival, we opened South by, that was uh, March. March of 2020. Okay. Okay, now you've done quite a bit of horror. I mean, you've done Carrie, that's a noticeable. Are you a fan of the horror genre? Is that something when you started acting that you uh, you seeked out roles in the, in the horror genre? So, like, to be honest with you, I didn't seek out these roles. These roles somehow seek me out. <laughs> I think I just have that face for death. I think people want to see me die, and usually in really gruesome ways. So I've had my head explode, I think, like four times on camera, um, which, you know, it, for me, it was always just a lot of fun because when you're dealing with gore, when you're dealing with these extreme situations in genre content, you know, imagine what it's like on set. Mm -hmm. It's all it's all comedy. You're putting, you're putting prosthetics on your face for four hours. What do you think you're going to talk about? You know, like, it, it's it's always a good time. So, for me, I've always enjoyed my experiences working in genre content. Do I watch it a lot? I like good thrill rides. Um, am I, like, a horror junkie? I gotta say I'm not. I, but but that's also, I'm such a doc junkie. Like, I, if, I, I love docs that, like, thriller docs mm -hmm. that really make you feel like this could happen to you or this is, I mean, this is real. I'm watching something real. That to me is so enticing, which you know comes back to something like you know on the toll, which uh, Blu-ray, by the way, get it on Blu-ray. Uh, with with the toll, um, just reading, my God, you know, a smartphone. He says yes. He drives up. He picks up the girl. They drive off into the wilderness and lose service. That is terrifying. If there's malicious intent, and that can be real, why wouldn't that be real? So to me, you know, that's what I'm gravitating towards, whether it's, you know, horror or not. I want real. And for Spencer, in the movie, when we get the big twist, everything falls into place for what he does. Now, uh, for the majority of the movie, we I am rooting for Spencer, for him and Cammy to trust and help each other until the end, obviously. But would you define Spencer as a true psychopath? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, but I will say, you know, every, every psychopath, you know, is human still. You know, maybe they've gone off the deep end and, and they've become desensitized to reality. But they you know, used to hug their mother goodnight when they were four years old and there was something maybe not wrong mm -hmm. back then, like something, you know, there's still someone in there that you can reason with potentially, or at least that you can understand their plight, you know, and I think that that's always something that's so important to me. Yes, he's a psychopath, but why, you know, why, even though I disagree with why he has these feelings, we need to understand people like that and why they have those feelings. And in the end, like they they need to be heard. He better not, you know, be be doing this. <laughs> this better not be real. I hope Spencer, you know, if he is real, he better be in prison. But I just think we really need to get the to the root of people and the root of characters and why people do the things that they do. That's that's a great point right there. And I don't think medical science does not even know why. A psychopath is a psych. Why they lack the ability to feel uh, empathy, sympathy, any kind of emotions. There was a great movie called The House That Jack Built, starring um, uh, Matt Dillon. And you yeah. see him standing in front of a mirror, and around his mirror, he has cut out of people displaying different emotions. And he's a psychopath in the movie. So he's practicing in the mirror how to look shocked how to be afraid, because he doesn't know it. He's never felt it. And I think that's a that's one of the greatest adaptations of showing us of what a psychopath really is. They just do not know how to act scared or any of it, so they have to emulate it. And I've heard a lot of doctors say that when psychopaths try to seek out treatment, 
it actually backfires because it teaches them even more how to play the system, how to game the system and just uh, fake the emotions that they need to get through life. Now, as we all, I mean, all psych, there are psychopaths. There is a legitimate con- a condition out there called psychopathy. But you're right in what you're saying is that they are real people and not all of them are murderers, rapists, and killers. Just mm-hmm. a very small few amount. It's not their fault that they were born with a condition that's still not understood by medical science. Now, what did you what did you do to prepare yourself for the role of Spencer? You know, he's a two parted person. The ninety yeah. percent of him and then the second part. Did you do separate prep for socially awkward Spencer until we get to be introduced to psychopath Spencer? I feel like it was all kind of wound into the same prep, which was really like, who is this guy? I want to know where he lives. I want to know, you know, what he ate for dinner last Thursday and why he's eating those Stouffer's turkey TV dinners with cranberry sauce. You know, like, why is he obsessed with us? That's never in the movie. But I wanted to know for me who this guy is, what makes him tick. Uh, you know, coming up in my mind of, of social interactions where where he feels like people have wronged him in the past and, and, and kind of justifying some of his actions. Because in the end, he doesn't think he's necessarily a bad guy. I mean, when you watch the movie in the end, you're like, okay, <laughs> maybe, how could he not see? But I, I think that he's, he's just he's so troubled and he's using this new technology to to kind of as a crutch he doesn't need to go meet someone at a bar he doesn't need to break his social you know norms he can literally sit in the car be in control and you know it's it's almost like i hate to say it but it's it's not not like it is prostitution but it's almost like he's paying for for this you know i agree it's he has to go out there and work for it. Absolutely. So just getting into that mindset of like, who is this guy? Why would he do these things? Why would a good person turn into a person who has these feelings, who actually takes it to the edge? Who is that person? So I think that's like, that's kind of the prep where my mind would go. That's awesome. When you, when you do that pivot at the end, the way you played it, the way you acted it out, I felt like Spencer was like, "Ha! Huh, I can drop the act. Now I can be who I really am. Is that what you were shooting for? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it was, you know, I'm probably, I'm a very fun kind of easygoing person. <laughs> and, and, you know, scenes like that are very not my regular day-to-day life. So I, I think that was a really hard scene. It was definitely the hardest scene of the film. We kept having to push it and push it and push it, truthfully, because I couldn't get my lines down. <laughs> so, so luckily, I had kind of lived it for three days in a row before we actually shot it, just because, and again, things like you know abnormal rain and all sorts of things kept delaying production. So luckily, I felt ready once I got there, but it was tough. It, turning like that without giving it away prior to that turn is so difficult. And, you know, it, it's just like you have to be so in character where you're not thinking what you're going to do next, even a millisecond before you do it. You just have to feel it, breathe into it, and then go for it. And, like, somehow it worked. It did work. Absolutely it worked. This film is – has – a little bit of supernatural, paranormal, psychological aspect. If you were describing this person and you were trying to say, hey, I this film is a, what would you categorize it at? Under, of course it's a horror movie, but as a subgenre, is it more for you psychological, supernatural, paranormal? Mine, okay, so I always prefer psychological. I always just like, as a general taste, Supernatural, as soon as, as soon as I can't relate to it, for me personally as a viewer, not necessarily as a creator, as like, you know, a producer, as an actor, but as a viewer, 
supernatural to me. I just, I can't, I don't know why. Maybe it's like I got some ADD and I just like, if I can't, if I don't feel like I could be in that world like this, if I shut my eyes, then I kind of don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that said, with our <laughs> film, what I love about it is that we do blend real life with that supernatural element. And Michael Nader, he is very much into the supernatural, which is why I trusted him with, with that plot completely. He, he is such a, a, a genre fan. He is so well-researched, and he's watched every horror and, and kind of psychological thriller and kind of mystical supernatural film ever made. I really think you got to get him on, John. He's, he's awesome. Uh, we're going we're gonna to reach out, absolutely. Yeah, he, and he's just so much smarter than I am, especially with all this stuff. So I'm excited for him to get on. But um, I would still call it a psychological thriller. I, I always want to kind of have the undertone of, of a social narrative. So I would say psychological thriller with kind of like talking about society. All, all of my films, I want to talk about society, but usually enter through the psychological thriller genre. Absolutely. Now, this movie has two aspects you have the relation well the i guess relationship is the right word between spencer and cammy and then you have the supernatural element with the toll man uh you know nader when he wrote this film i don't know if he even realized that he opened the door to a lot of possibilities beyond this movie i personally want to see uh, either more of a backstory to the Toll Man, because the Toll Man, we don't know if it's a single entity. We have we saw them as many as a group wearing those scary, you know, masks. I'm really fascinated to see either a, a prequel, uh, more backstory to the Toll Man, or you can do it a completely other way. You know, Jesse, I mean, um, Cammy's and Spencer's story is done, but you could put a completely different set of people into the tall man's path. What do you think about that? I love it. I, I completely agree. I think that the tall man is all around us all the time. So I feel like it's so open ended where this could go. The tall man could, you know, appear in Cancun during, you know, March break or, you know, spring break. The tall man could appear literally anywhere. Whenever he smells the hint of death, he can appear. So I think it, for me, that's very exciting. I, uh, I love the idea of, you know, exploring in, in some ways, you know, a, a prequel. I love, you know, the older woman, the older woman on the tractor. I'm really kind of interested in, in when she saw the tall man before, kind of at a younger age. I feel like that's kind of an interesting storyline um, and kind of, you know, a bit of a just an origin story, you know, that 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 can really dig up the past of who the Toll Man is and, and, and why this mythology kind of came about. Absolutely. Now, did you guys film this in Canada? We did. Did you hear that when I said about? Were you like, oh, for sure. <laughs> I know you're a native Canadian, so... Uh, the whole movie was shot in, in Canada and absolutely. Okay. Oh, That's all. Yeah. Uh, now obviously the big plot twist, is that meant to be the big, you know, surprise for the audience? I think so. I think, you know, for me as an audience member, that's the one that, that really kind of kicked me in the gut. And, and I was like, whoa, 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 what, how, why? I can't believe you've played with my heart, you know? Um, but I feel like the whole film kind of does just there's these weird twists and turns along the entire way. But I would definitely say that one, that's the one that'll probably stick with people. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, as far as today's real world and any kind of social commentary, uh, is this to make people aware of, hey, be careful who you get into that ride sharing car with? Yeah, and I think it's, you know, so much more than just the rideshare car. It's like we do everything now with complete trust of, of the stranger, which I'm all for. I'm all for trusting strangers. I'm just saying, <laughs> if someone brings you, you know, food or beverage or picks you up or if anyone has malicious intent, 
it is so easy for you to become a victim. So it's more so about like just kind of waking up to to the world around us and not not forget what your mother always said of don't get into you know a car with a stranger. Um, you know, like I was doing some research when I first read the script, and I was shocked to find how much you know assault, rape, murder occurs within ride shares globally. Yeah. Both. The, the passenger and on the driver. It's not it's not one side or the other. There's whacked out people on both sides. And like, what do you really need to, to, to set up an account with one of these companies? Mm-hmm. I'm all for these companies. I use them all the time. I'm just saying we should think a little bit more before we get into a car and just kind of know how we're going to, you know, play the situation if something were to go afoul. Absolutely. I mean, give somebody the benefit of the doubt, but you don't know who they are, you know, just, you know, have that somewhere in your train of thought. And this is a strictly your, exactly. Now, this is a strictly uh, your opinion question. Do you think the toll man that, you know, Spencer fell upon and was working towards his favor, you think in your opinion, did he want Spencer life or did he want Cammy's life? I think that in the end, he didn't care. I think that all he needs is a life. And I think that he probably thought that, that Spencer was a good, um, addition. Yeah, exactly. Like he, he knew that Spencer would given the opportunity would take it, you know? Where I think most people put in this situation, including like say for sequels or whatever the case is, most people put in this situation similar to Saws and similar to all these now other horror movies. What do people do when they're put in that situation? Is it going to be me? Is it going to be her? Is it going to be him? Is it going to be me? It, it, people make very interesting decisions, um, and I think most of them wouldn't choose to to kill the other person. Mm-hmm. You know. Hopefully, Spencer does. Um, but I feel like that that's something where the toll man kind of saw a vulnerability in, in Cammy to some extent and saw opportunity in Spencer and took it. I agree. Now, you, we said earlier, you're also a producer in this film. You star in it. Uh, what uh, did your producing role require of you for the toll? So... You know, it's it's tricky. These these films that are kind of you know small passion projects, um, you kind of have to do everything. So it, it was a small crew. Um, I think in the end we might have only had maybe thirty five people. I can't remember. It was two years ago at this point. But um, you know, it was a small crew. So I was doing everything from securing all of our vendors. You know, raising all of the money, hiring crew, allocating funds. Um, you know, finding locations, getting insurance policies, you know, making sure that, that, you know, the crane didn't sink into the ground. And if it did, you got to find the heavy metal machinery, you know, vendor that'll come and tow you out in the middle of the night. It's just nonstop. You know, it's catering. It's, it's, we lost our garbage person and I'd have to make garbage runs, you know, it's yeah. everything. So, Yeah. When you were uh, now your producer, you were the, uh, one of the co-stars. Would you do a scene and then go back and take a look at it as a producer and say, "All right, good, no." You know what? That's a great question. Uh, to be honest with you, no. I, I, for the most part, if I was acting in any of it, I would just kind of trust Nader, trust the director. Um, and we had great people around too. We had, you know, Michael Moosey, who was a co-producer on it, who's got a great eye. If anything, you know, if I was really botching it, he would have come up to me and said, Max, you got to get your shit together. <laughs> um, so uh, I felt comfortable watching the monitor when I was on camera. But um, when I was not in a scene, I was absolutely behind monitor when, when I had time. Um, but it, it is, you know, film sets are so much about trust, especially coming from a producer standpoint. You hire the right people so you don't have to be hovering. You know, you hire the right people so there's fewer fires for you to put out along the way. 
Now, you mentioned that pivot that we see was one of the hardest things to film. Uh, what is your favorite? Was that your also favorite dialogue because it was so challenging for you? Or did you have another piece that you enjoyed more? So I would say my favorite, that it's, it, it is probably my favorite scene in the movie as an actor. The dialogue was really, really fun in the car off the top, the first 15, 20 minutes of the film. That's a lot of fun. You know, it, it, it's just, that's kind of my natural um, kind of habitat for acting is just that kind of one-on-one -on -one sparring, you know, sometimes making it weird and awkward, sometimes having a good laugh, you know, but, but just staying fully committed with that kind of, you know, tennis back and forth between two actors. I love that stuff. So, so yeah. Now, you, you and Jordan, you described you guys are longtime friends. How long did it actually, how long did filming take, in particular, the car ride scene before you break down when it's just you and Jordan in the car conversing back and forth. How long did that sequence take to film? So I think originally we were trying to shoot it all on our first night of, of principal photography. We could we could only afford to have the special vehicle uh, that 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 like pulls the the car, the picture car, and you film from the back, like kind of like balcony of this massive truck. Um, so we could only get that car for one night. And so we were supposed to shoot all of that stuff in one night. We couldn't get it. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I couldn't remember my lines. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell. Um, but, you know, I had a lot on my mind producing it and it being the first day of principal and, you know, dealing with all the vendors, all the equipment, everything, trying to get it all in one place. Um, so in, in the end, I think, it only took two days for everything actually driving. Um, and then the rest of the film, I believe we shot it. It was short. It was either, it was 12 to 14 days total shoot. I can't remember if it was 12 or 14, but it was short. That's actually pretty common. Uh, you know, when it comes to films like The Toll, I always say you don't need a big budget to make a great horror movie. You need a good script, good acting, you know, and then everybody pitching in because they really believe in the project. And then you have this great movie like The Toll. Uh, uh, Spencer's weapon of choice seems to be a bow and arrow. And you got to use it once when you're trying to take out Cammy. Uh, did you practice how to use a bow and arrow? Do you know how to personally use a bow and arrow? No, I had never, ever used a bow and arrow before this. But I there was like... I, I found a training facility for bow and arrow in Toronto and I went and I went for like, I think two hours. And when I was done, I thought I knew everything. I thought I was so cool <laughs> with my bow and arrow. And then I showed up on set and this, the, the production designer, he had bought a very different bow and arrow than what he had told me he was going to buy and what I trained with. So on the day, the one that I had to use while shooting was like three times the size of the one that I had gotten so comfortable with. <laughs> so I was running around feeling like I was looking like an idiot. So hopefully like it, it doesn't feel out of place, but I had no idea how to use it properly. That's funny. Now you said you and Jordan are like business partners or good friends, have known each other for the longest time. Have you guys ever appeared in a movie together before, acted together? So we have, we, um, our, our first feature that we produced, it's called Almost Anything. Uh, it should be available on, on iTunes and on Amazon and everywhere, but it's very much not a, a genre film. It's a drama. Okay. It's an awful genre, but it's, you know, a really, really, it's just kind of a, a, a coming of age ensemble film about, you, you know, the next the next cycle in life, like, you know, getting married and settling down. And it's, it's just kind of this angsty, I think it's a fun little film, but it's this angsty film about like around the dinner table, what these friends decide to do before they like go into their thirties or go into their kind of like next step in life. So it's, it's a little raunchy. I'd watch it. It's kind of fun. <laughs> but... Definitely sounds fun. Now, uh, Spencer and Cammy played off each other so well. You guys did so well. 
Uh, do you think that had a lot to do with you and Jordan being such good friends? Absolutely. And I think like, you know, for better and for worse, I think that, you know, the, the moments where we looked like we really trusted each other and we had finally seen eye to eye um, and we're kind of like a journey, kind of a team together. That's Jordan and I, that's, that's us truly. And, you know, I just, I, I love her. She's amazing. And, and we, you know, really we're trying to build this cool company for him films with all sorts of great projects. So she's amazing. But I will say, you know, while shooting tensions are high, you know, like we, we're not sleeping much. We're both producing it. We're both acting in it. And it's very intense, lowish budget. You know, it's raining like hell We're the shower stopped working. There's no electricity. Things are going wrong. Tensions were really, really high. So I think, you know, for some of those scenes where there is some aggression between us, there is distrust. There is, you know, all of that below the surface stuff. We were able to use our producing in the moment of like, I am so frustrated that we don't have the right lights. They didn't make it here on time and action. And then like, <laughs> you know, so we were frustrated with each other too. So it was, it, it all just worked out the way it was supposed to. Another one of my favorite uh, sequence of events in the movies is where we get to see Cammy in the woods and the tall man is bringing up her traumatic past. Uh, I love that. That is so beautifully done. How uh, important to the storyline do you think Cammy's past traumatic experience plays to the overall story of the movie? I mean, I, I think it's it, it's pretty apparent. It's pretty you know uh, cut and dry as as being a major part of this film. Um, I would say hopefully it kind of reminds. Um, I know what Jordan would say is that hopefully it really shows, especially young women, kind of not not ever to, and this is what she would always say, I'm just repeating her, but to never be the victim, you know, to like always fight back, to always understand your worth, to always kind of understand that 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 you you do have power inside of you to overcome. So I feel like that that kind of brings some inspiring um, kind of afterthoughts when you think about the film and you think about her journey you think about everything that she has overcome in her life as cammy but then in the end with the toll man with spencer with everything and she still made it out alive a uh, spoiler alert um yeah, that's but like, that should be that should be really inspiring and i think by seeing her backstory and and you know backstory that so many young women can can relate to I think that's important, and and I know Jordan and Michael Nader as well, and you know Will Will Frank for that matter. Everyone really agrees that that's a story that. One of the most powerful moments in the film is in that sequence when older deathbed Cammy is talking to current Cammy, uh, also when younger Cammy, uh, as she was going through the abuses looks to current Cammy and says, it gets better, doesn't it? And she she can't answer it. She's like, because she knows the answer is no. That was a gut-wrenching moment. Do you agree? Completely agree. And I think that, you know, we, we just had such great actors. We were so lucky to have, you know, obviously Jordan's amazing, but some of the older actors, you know, in the group that, just you know they have this theater background and they're just so strong and oh we were really lucky to cast who we cast how do you feel i mean the two you know we there are other people that come and go they're just you know like her dad the woman on the tractor but it's really a two actor movie how do you yeah. feel making a movie where it's really just two main characters and really nobody else. It's hard. You really have to trust the actors, you know, like I, I, I mean, I barely trusted us, but we had no choice to do it. To do it. But, you know, really, if you're saying I'm putting all of my money or I'm hedging all of my bet on only these two people, and both of them have to live up to their side of the deal or this is going to be worthless. That's a lot of pressure. It is. 
Whereas if you have an ensemble picture, it's like, oh, yeah, that person sucks, but, you know, whatever. You know, the nice nice person, I'd love to work with them, but, you know, are they working for the role? Are they not a very good actor? Can they really hold up? There's always going to be that when you have more people, but you can get away with it. Whereas when you only have that two-hander, if there's a weak performance, I'm turning the movie off, yeah. and so is the So it's, it's a risk, but I think it's well worth it if executed properly. Now, asking this question to you, and, and uh, I'd lo- let's see if we can respond from the production side of things. From making a movie, uh, I've heard a lot of people say that if you're on a budget, especially a small budget, and you want to make a film, horror movies are the way to go. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, 100%. Why um, is that? I, so I would say uh, a couple of things. One single location is actually possible. That's probably the biggest thing. The, where, where you spend money in film is moving from location to location. That is outrageously costly. So, um, okay, so that's number one. Okay, great. So if you can have it be all on this dark street, if you can have it all be in that house, if you can have it all be wherever it is. So that's first off. Second off, successful horror films, as you said, don't always need major star value. So, again, if you can have a single location with great actors who maybe have some good credits but are not, you know, household names, A-list stars – you can still have a successful horror movie. Um, and also, I think the fans are just so ravenous. So if you, can, if you can convince them that even if you have a little bit lower production value, but you've got a really cool concept that they're going to want to see, they don't care if the audio in the second act drops out three decibels after he says blah, 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 blah. They don't care, mm-hmm. you know? But if, if you're, you know, selling a, a Marvel, if you're selling a major blockbuster you know you better have the third decibel on the set you you know so i just think it's more forgiving in horror um and yeah so i would say absolutely you're right you can make a great horror movie on a budget if somebody goes into the theater and they've paid their 20 dollars and they're gonna watch a marvel movie yeah they're gonna expect all the bells and whistles so i definitely see your point there out of all the roles that you have acted in is there one that really sticks out as your favorite? Um, hmm. I've, there's been a lot of great roles that I've been so lucky to play, but I will say probably the most fun I've ever had still to this day is Suits. Harold, I don't know if you watch Suits, but working with those actors, you know, Rick Hoffman. Rick Hoffman's the most amazing improv artist I've ever worked with in my life. I've learned so much from him. Um, so yeah, I would say Harold Gunderson was probably my favorite role, but I love every role that I play. Let me ask you this question. Uh, like if you just had to pick moving forward in your career, someone says, Max, you either could continue as an actor, as a producer. What would you pick? Producer, guaranteed. Really? There's not- Why? Uh, um, because... I love to create things. And as an actor, it's really, really difficult to actually create things. And if you want to create something, you better learn to produce, you know? So I would say no one's giving me an ultimatum saying you can't act ever again. And, you know, I'm I'm just not going to ever allow anyone to give me that ultimatum. But if anyone did, guaranteed producing, and I would be totally content and happy for the rest of my life. That is so awesome. I was, I, I almost would have bet, you know, with the majority, if I asked the majority of my guests, I, I'm, uh, I think every, even the viewers, they'd be like, oh, acting, acting. And that's why I love your answer, because it's out of the box. It, it's just like, if you want to create, acting is, is not for you. <laughs> You are, you are as an actor, yes, there is some creative control that you get to have, but in the end, you are the puppet, you know, and that's the art. The art is you are the puppet. That's why the director is the director. They are the puppet master. Well, realistically, the studio is the puppet master, you know, but, but there's the hierarchy. And as an actor, um, you are not well positioned to be a storyteller you are well positioned to be the mouthpiece of another storyteller. Where would you put writers in that hierarchy? 
I mean, it, it's all fuzzy and difficult to say exactly, but and depending on the caliber of the writer and where they are in their career. But, you know, say, for instance, on the toll, it's a writer director. Yeah. You know, that, that gives him a lot of creative control. Does he have all the creative control? Absolutely not, because the producers still technically own it and run the show. But when you trust someone, you kind of give them that creative control. And I just want to be able to, in the end, decide what stories I feel like are important to be told and then finding the best possible people to tell that story. That, to me, is like the most exciting aspect of the film industry. Acting is so much fun, but I see it as so much fun. Producing, I want to make a difference. I want to change the world. That's what I want to do. That's beautifully explained. I mean, I totally get it. Now, let's go to a, a little bit further back in time. Let's go to Carrie, 2013. I'm assuming you've seen the original Carrie. How did you feel walking and doing a reboot of a cult classic, to put it mildly, with Sissy Spacek as the lead role back in the day, and then here you guys, and it's been done so many times, are trying to remake it, reboot it. As an actor, is there a little bit of trepidation that the pressure is on you? A hundred percent. And and you always kind of know it's not going to end well. You know, it's like if you're trying to reboot the most famous movie of all time, you know. Um, so I think it's always, you know, nerve wracking. Um, but it was a lot of fun. I, I had a great time on that set, met great people. You know, as soon as I heard that Julianne Moore was, was attached to it, I was like, anything that she does, I trust, she, I love. She's brilliant. She's brilliant. So, you know, it was great, you know, and to see Chloe Moretz really kind of, you know, she was maybe 19 at the time, like really sink her teeth into this and go for it. It was a fun experience. I had a great time. Also, you know, seeing something done in the genre on such a budget was a great learning experience for me to see like where they've spent the money to create what they ended up creating and kind of learning from that and how to make things for far cheaper you know? um, and understanding kind of the economics behind film production, especially when it comes to kind of blockbuster genre, um, which is what, a, you know, Carrie kind of was. So it, it was a great experience. Loved it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I didn't really see it though. I saw, I saw the premiere. I went to the premiere and I don't think I've seen it since. So I can't, I can't, you know, specifically say, they did a great job or whatever the case. I can't. Remember. I liked Carrie. I liked the remake. Of course, it's not going to be the original. Nothing is going to measure up to the original. It was a great film. But on its own, I liked the remake of Carrie. How do you feel um, playing antagonist? Like in Carrie, you were a bully. You were one of the dick characters, for lack of a better term. Uh, in The Toll, you're a psychopath. Do you prefer playing the bad guy? So it's interesting. Like I don't know if I prefer playing the bad guy. I just like layered characters. I like characters with depth, whether it's good depth or bad depth, but something going on under the surface, you know? Um, I, I, I think that's what I look for. And I, more importantly, like what is the message of the script? That's way beyond what I look for in a character. If I read anything, it's like, what conversation is this going to spawn when people leave the theaters why is that an important conversation to start so if i don't see something that really entices me about like people need to be talking about that this will in some way shape or form benefit society because it stirs conversation yeah. um, if, if it's not doing that then i'm not really interested you know, so and then and then it doesn't really matter what the character is. Is it am I going to do it for a paycheck or am I just not going to do it at all? You know, it's then then that's the question. Um, so yeah, I yeah. Being hopefully we are starting to at least see some light in this COVID pandemic uh, that we've been in now for well over a year. How has the industry, from your point of view? change to the point where this is going to be permanent change moving forward 
So I think in in multiple directions things have changed. For for production itself, holy moly, what a change! Like we we shot two projects during the height of the pandemic. Um, a feature called Fixation, which is incredible. We're just locking it now. It's starring Genesis Rodriguez from Umbrella Academy and uh, Maddie Hassan from Malignant, mm -hmm. James X movie, Warner Brothers. Um, so we, we wrapped that during COVID. And so, you know, we, we locked down the entire crew. We had hundreds of people staying in a, in a one hotel that we rented the entire place. Convention center. We had all of our offices in there. It was a single location shoot, um, and we just bust people back and forth. They couldn't go anywhere outside of our bubble, and so that was incredibly costly. It was really like mentally aggravating for the crew. It was really hard, uh, especially because so much of the crew was local to the town that we were shooting in. Their family was a few blocks away, and we said, sorry, you can't even see them for a month and a half. <laughs> so, you know, there's just the, the actual production issues that come with COVID, which I think they will pass. Those will pass. Mm -hmm. um, but where the long-term ramifications will come, I feel like, is in release strategy and in kind of monetizing theatrical versus VOD and kind of the different markets within the VOD ecosystem and just kind of how the economics will work post -time. Now, the VOD yeah. thing was coming. You could see it. It was coming, no doubt about it. COVID just really pushed up the date. Do you think moving forward, movie theaters are in trouble? I think they're absolutely in trouble. I think that there will be key winners that come out of this. Um, and it's the, it's, the, it's the theater operators and owners that are going to be invented. If, if you're going to a film, you're not just going to see the toll. You're going there to have a drink. You're going there to be social. You're going there to have a great dinner. You're going there because you get a 4D effect when you know the, the horror movie shoots out fire, you feel the flame. Whatever it is, you need more. This no longer can just be a popcorn and soda situation. Mm -hmm. You add on your couch. So show me what else you're offering. And there's absolutely going to be companies out there that are going to do a great job. Um, but it, things are going to change. And I think that uh, at home first run viewing is here to stay. And I think that it'll just be very interesting to see how the platforms adapt to this when it comes to um, how much they're willing to spend on quality products that does not go to the theaters, that goes directly to them. So I think just understanding the new marketplace is going to be interesting over the next couple of years. Now, for it's a different issue for distributors and production companies. Production companies have to bear a lot of costs with all these new COVID uh restrictions in place distributors have to be more picky and choosy as to what they pick up so we really we, we just gotta wait and see how it just plays out yeah i mean yeah. yeah uh i love the fact that video on demand i love simultaneous release making it available for people who because like you just said People go to the theater not just to see a movie. It's a whole experience that they're paying for. Uh, right. Then you have the people who just want to see the movie and they're more comfortable watching it at home. So right. I really think that the people who want to go to the movie, even if it is available to them on video on demand, they are still going to go to the movies. Do you agree? Oh, for sure. I think there's always going to be a market for it. And I just like, let's see what the major players do if they play their cards right in the next couple of years in order to keep that industry afloat or else it's just going to be a consolidation of, you know, two companies and they're just going to, you know, own everything and they're going to pump their digital kind of release at the same time as their theatrical release. And they're going to own it on both sides. Yeah. And maybe that's going to be great. You know, but when it comes to independent film, thank God we've got independent theaters. We opened up 50 theaters across the country on March 26th. Wow. We went to a drive-in just outside of L.A., and there were, like,
like, you know, it was a Saturday night. We we had, I think, 71 cars with three, four people in each car. It was an amazing experience. Who would have thought yeah. drive-ins would be come back? I mean, yeah. yeah. How would you yeah. how would you describe uh, the Canadian filming industry as opposed to the U.S. filming industry? Are they both the same thing, or is there or there are some subtle differences here and there? Um, I, I think it depends on exactly what we're talking about. But say, for instance, you know, with Canada, we've got incredible crews. Um, you know, we've got incredible landscapes, we've got incredible locations, we've got incredible talent base with actors, but our lure is, you know, always comes down to financial, right? So it's like, we've got great tax credits. <laughs> we've got great, great, great tax credits, you know, the dollar is weak, you know, ish. Um, so it's, it, it all comes down to the financial and it, it just makes financial sense to shoot in Canada. Um, we've got great public funding bodies for Canadian films. It's it's a really really solid industry. Uh, so we we kind of structure all of the films we do as Canadian productions or as Canadian co-productions, even though they're all kind of like you know Hollywood exactly. films. Exactly. Yeah. Now we have time for one more question. What do you prefer doing acting in uh, best, TV or film? So that's a good question. You know, I, I, whew, that's really tough. I would say like my, I have more experience in TV and I, so I just, you know, I've been doing that literally forever. Um, as I have been with film, but film is kind of, you know, it's a little bit more prestige, uh, at least it used to be. Now there's so much prestige television. Um, but it, I, I love them both. I love them both. And I feel like more so it's a difference of, um, you know, comedy and drama, whether when you're performing at a high end, I hope that television and film is basically interchangeable, mm -hmm. you know, it is on that high end level. If I'm watching HBO, it doesn't matter if it's a feature or if it's a series, I'm watching HBO, you know? So, um, I would say I love both. I think I, I, I probably prefer comedy over drama, um, as an actor, just cause I love comedy. And even in horror, even with Spencer, I feel like I, I really love those comedic moments where I got to, you know, cough as I was like, you know, and, and like, sorry, I can be a little awkward. It's like, it's just having fun with it and fully committing. Like, that's the name of the game. That's what I love. Absolutely. And Max, you were absolutely fabulous in The Toll. I mean, guys, if you have not watched The Toll, please go out, buy the Blu-ray, Buy it on your video on demand, demand streaming services. The movie is an hour and 20 minutes, but it's an hour and 20 minutes of amazing storytelling, amazing acting. You won't regret it. Max, it's been a pure honor talking to you here tonight. We could have talked for another three hours. Thank you so much for being here with us. Is there any final thoughts you want to share? Uh, you know what? Just uh, you know, keep looking out for 4AM Films, you guys. That's my my company. We've got great projects on the go. Uh, so follow our socials, 4AM Film Studios, uh, on Facebook, Instagram. I think we got the TikTok. We're doing the whole thing. Um, but yeah, we've got a, a great film called Fixation that you should be able to see pretty soon, uh, as well as a series called Something Undone, which is quite scary, and I feel like your crowd might really like it, John. Absolutely. We will definitely be on the lookout. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Max, again, thank you so much for being on our show, guys. Tomorrow, there will be no live broadcast because, Max, you know, we're real people, and tomorrow I'm getting my fuse box changed in my home. <laughs> so I'm not going to have power all day. <laughs> well, we'll be back on the air on Wednesday on behalf of Max Toplin and myself. Stay safe, guys, and stay walking. Good night.